Welcome to Brave with Lisa. This space is designed to inspire, champion, and equip you to bravely walk in that unique rhythm of grace and calling that God has designed just for you. I'm so excited you're joining us today. Welcome to Brave with Lisa. I'm your host, Lisa Bruton. And today I'm so excited because I've got my friend, Aaron Bullock, and we go way back, but um, he and his family are living overseas. They're really living outside of the box and doing some really cool things. So I can't wait to hear more from him and just learn from you today, Aaron. So welcome. Thanks, Lisa. It's good to see you. It's been a while. It certainly has. Uh, So Aaron, can you tell us about what you're doing and where you are and what you're passionate about. Sure. So we're in uh, Colombia in a town called Cali. It's probably most famous for its drug cartels. Um, Mm -hmm. We're doing youth work here. So we do youth camps and I kind of mentor a whole bunch of kids and do a lot of discipling, one-on-one sort of stuff. Yep. That's amazing because actually, Aaron, I know you from Australia and we grew up when we were teenagers and young adults. Can you share how did you end up heading over to Columbia? Sure. Um, so after school, I kind of started a business um, and it went really well. My wife started a business as well and they both kind of went kind of like really well really quickly. Mm. And so we got to the point where we were both talking about like life and finances and we both were in agreement that we never really wanted to go down that, you know, like nine to five path, retire when you're 60, you know, accumulate all this wealth um that just wasn't for us um but we felt that god was definitely blessing our business in a way that was out like if anyone knows me anyone that knows me will know that i'm a hard worker but i'm definitely not business orientated um but god clearly blessed my business in in that season and we both were like i remember talking to a guy from church uh, Mm -hmm. matt forbes and he was saying because i was really big on like i liked evangelizing and i liked talking with people um, about God and my business was kind of taking over that part of my life. Mm. And so uh, I remember Forbes, you just saying, Hey, listen, you're in a season right now, make hay while the sun's shining. God will call upon this money at some point. Um, At the time I didn't really take those words too, you know, seriously, but I just kept going, making money. And then it got to a point where both me and my wife are like, okay, we've got enough money to kind of live for the rest of our lives. What do we want to do? Yeah. Um, I wanted to buy a yacht and sail the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> my wife did a short-term missions trip to the Philippines. Uh, mm-hmm. She was part of Compassion and she went and visited an island that we sponsored, not we, our church did. Mm-hmm. And um, she came back and she's like, hey, let's, let's do this full-time as missionaries. So we got in contact with Pioneers. That's who we work for um, mm-hmm. or missionaries with. Um, they gave us a list of all the places around the world that we can work in. Um, it's huge. They've got like so many missionaries out there. So they just said, listen, you'll have to narrow it down. So I said, well, from a selfish point of view, I've always wanted to speak Spanish. So we kind of looked at all of the teams that were in Latin America. Uh, we went and did a trip for six weeks back in 2017, 16, something like that. Um, we visited, I don't know, like 20, 30 teams, something like that with pioneers. Um, and yeah, we kind of like just visited all the teams and then we had kind of a bit of a checklist that we wanted to kind of tick off that we're like okay god we're we're happy to do this but we need some requirements here um one of the boxes was we had to work within a really good team we're like we we've just heard of so many missionaries getting burnt out that Mm -hmm. just have you know like people on the team that aren't good uh and so we're like okay the team has to be amazing that's that has to be a tick and the second one was it has to be able to be youth focused um and so when we arrived we had a we had a trip booked so we arrived in Argentina but then we flew straight up to Colombia and then we were working our way down so Colombia was the first place that we visited yeah wow uh, and we got there and the team was awesome they're like uh an elderly well not elderly they're like 60s but they've been in Colombia for forever um and so they're awesome they're from North Carolina or South Carolina or wherever Raleigh is mm-hmm. somewhere in the states the bible belt there um, and they're amazing. They're like super laid back. It's like working with Aussies. They're so amazing. Yeah. Wow. And um, so we, that ticked the box straight away. And then they said to us, like literally on the first day, they're like, Hey, we don't know what you guys are about, but we kind of planted a church here and we really have, we like youth is our biggest need. 
And this wow. is before we even mentioned anything to them. So we were like, okay, two big ticks. Yeah. But we were also like, we've got like another six countries to visit <laughs> and like 20 odd teams. We weren't ready to sign on the dotted line. Yeah. Um, so we kind of left that. We kept traveling. We had another six weeks to go. And I was just expecting God to kind of blow, like blow Colombia out of the water. Like I was mm-hmm. waiting for God to like be like, oh, here's where you actually were meant to be. And like mm-hmm. we visited Peru and all these cool places in Bolivia and they all kind of half ticked boxes. Um, Bolivia ticked both of the boxes, the team there. Mm-hmm. Um, but the biggest question for us was right before we were leaving Colombia, um, the team, they were like, hey, listen, we, their name's Ron and Debbie. They're like, we've been thinking about retiring. Um, we're probably going to retire in the next six months. Um, not probably, we are. Mm-hmm. And so when we left Colombia, uh, that was like a big X in one of the boxes for yeah. both me and Anne. We were just like, okay, well, Colombia's not it then. And I was, so I was waiting for God to like really, you know, oh, Bolivia's it. Look at, oh, amazing. And so we finished our trip with a real uncertainty of mm-hmm. what, where do we go next? And I remember we're sitting in New Zealand airport, flying home, waiting for our next flight. And we were jet lagged. It was like two o'clock in the morning. But for mm-hmm. us, because it was Latin time, we were like, oh, we're wide awake. So <laughs> me and the kids are all in this airport waiting for our flight. And we're just like, let's do up a, like a pros and cons list of all of our options. So we put all the teams down. We ticked everything and we're just like, and there was a big X on Columbia for the team. Mm. Um, but I just said to Angela, I'm like, man, for some reason, my heart just, I just want Columbia so bad. Wow. Like I feel, and we, both me and Angela hadn't really spoken about this the whole trip because we were so busy. So this was the first time we'd actually sat down and actually talked about it. And she was um, expecting me to say no to Columbia because of that. And she's like, listen, I've been thinking the same thing. Wow. We asked our kids, we're like, hey, if you could go anywhere, where would you go out of all the countries? And they all, they said Colombia as well. And so we both were just like, we can't ignore that. Let's mm. let's say yes to this. So we prayed about it a bit and said yes to Colombia. So anyway, we fast forward a couple of weeks, we Skype the team that were retiring and said, hey, listen, we've decided to come to Colombia. We realize you guys won't be there, but we just thought we'd let you know. Um, we'll be the team. And anyway, they were kind of like, okay, that's cool. Anyway, they, they um, Skype us back like a week later and they just said, listen, we've been praying for like the last year whether we should retire or not. And we had a list of our own and we said, if you got, if you want us to stay, you have to send a young couple to come and help us. Oh. And so, yeah, it was cool. It was, and when they said that to me, I was just like, oh my goodness, wow, what a, a huge confirmation for yeah. both of us that this is where we were meant to be going. And so it was awesome. We, um, it took us about a year to kind of finalize our businesses, sell them off and put our money into kind of assets to, to fund us to be overseas. And then we, yeah, we moved over there and they kind of helped us migrate in and they've been awesome. So. That's incredible. I love that. That's a real process. And you did it together as a family, which I really love that, that you did it with your kids. You asked them, you invited them into the conversations, you know, they got to see everything that you saw. Um, And so as a family, you went and was there, was there anyone in the family that was like, I don't really want to do this, but I'm going to do it. Or was everyone no well like our kids were quite young when we went like in our immediate family just our kids and my my wife we were all on agreement because the kids like our eldest when we we moved she was like what seven or eight something like that yeah and so for her she didn't really have this concept of home is like a physical location home for her was where we went yeah so it's kind of like it's a bit different when you've got teenagers and stuff because they're like oh I'm leaving all my friends and yeah so for our kids it was it was we'll go where you go and they were they just I don't know we're all adventurers, so they kind of like, yeah, let's do it. So what was it like? So, you know, you, you've you tied up your businesses and, and you know, taken a year to do that, and then you arrive in Colombia. What was it like when you when you first arrived? Because I've heard the first three months is kind of like <laughs> on, almost a honeymoon period, and then, it, and then it's the reality yeah. sets in. Yeah, 100%, that's how it was. Um, we got there, and Colombia is, like, wild and amazing. We live in, like, the kind of like on the the edge of the Amazon slash jungle. So we're surrounded wow. by mountains. And so it's it's kind of cool. Like you get there and you're just like, oh my goodness, I've never really lived in another country like this. You know, everyone's speaking a different language. Oh, there's beans everywhere and chorizo and all this nice food. And you're like, mm-hmm. wow, this is cool. So yeah, there was a, there was a honeymoon period. Um, our transition went really well because we had the team already here. They helped us set up, our, they helped us find a house and well, an apartment that we're renting um they helped us get a car all of these things so it was 
we, for us, the process was really easy in the sense that it only took us probably like three weeks before we had like, we had a Colombian ID card. We had a, like a, a physical car, an apartment. I know people that have come to Colombia and it took them six months to get these things organized yeah, just incredible. because it's the developing world. It takes so long to do anything in Latin America, but we had everything kind of, yeah, organized within a couple of weeks to a month. So it was a really smooth process. Um, but yeah, the honeymoon period definitely it was around for probably, I would say six months for us. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of kicked in and it went, yeah, it was, it was really hard after that. Um, really, really hard. Yeah. And what made it hard? What were the things uh, that in were the hard? Sense, in the sense, for me, um, uh, I found it really hard in the sense that, so in Australia, I was kicking goals. Like my business was going really well. I was um, volunteering at Mueller one day a week as a chaplain. I was a youth pastor one day a week at our church. So things were just going really well for us in mm -hmm. Australia. And so to leave all of that, to come to Colombia um, and learn another language and learn another culture, to me, it was, it shattered my ego because yeah. I've been someone that always, I picked things up quite quickly in my life. Uh, and I, this is, so this is how out of control my ego is. I, <laughs> Before coming to Colombia, I literally said to a friend, I'm like, I'm going to learn Spanish in under six months. I'm like, hands down. I'm like, I learned the drums in like a week. I'm going to learn Spanish in less than six months. Anyway, we've been there for six months. And a little story, I remember Ange was like, oh, we've run out of bread. Go down to the bread, uh, the bakery and get some bread, which is just down the bottom of our, it's literally across the road from where we lived. And I had this anxiety come over me like, but I've got to speak Spanish. No. And it was something as simple as, give me a loaf of bread and then I came home but I was just like I do not want to speak Spanish it was a really humbling process for me because you kind of go from you know like talking like this is quite natural but then you mm -hmm. go into this setting where you're talking like a baby again you're not really understanding what's going on you kind of yeah it, it, for me it was really really humbling um and the language it took me it took me probably about a year till I felt comfortable in the language, um, which was from what I've heard still very quick. It is. But, I was going to say that's impressive. Um, yeah. But I was expecting it to be a lot quicker. <laughs> so it's, um, it was very hard. Um, also too, because I'd come from kicking goals at Mueller and, and at our church as a youth pastor um, to not see any fruit in our ministry as well was really crippling for me. Mm. Um, I had a period, probably about a year into our time, I had a period where I just felt like, I'm like, what have we done? What are we doing? I felt like God was really distant as well mm -hmm. uh, from my life. And I don't know why that was. I think it was just, sit I was situationally depressed because mm -hmm. um, I knew what would get me. Like, I've never been depressed before, but I was depressed because I was in this situation. I didn't mm -hmm. have like a close group of mates to hang around with. Like, you know, like you have a ha bad day. I can always be like, oh, let's just go. I can go to the pub and have a beer with your brother Addo or, or Dino and like, and just debrief and then life's all good. And then I can, you know, I'll have a surf and that clears my head. I had mm -hmm. none of that. I had no beach near me. I had no close friends. They were all Spanish speaking friends. And if I had a bad day. The thought of going out and speaking Spanish was like the worst. Yeah. And so I'd kind of, there was a six month period from about a year being into a year and a half where I was like, I think, God's not in this with us. I actually had, I even said to my wife, I'm like, is he even real? Like mm. I had thought maybe I've just made all this up. Maybe I've just taken a, pl a placebo pill and Christianity's made me feel good. And now the reality set in and I'm like, what am I doing? Mm. And so there was a good six months where I was like, really, really, really like, I'd stop reading my Bible. I'd stopped doing anything to do with Christianity apart from, we were still doing ministry, which is kind yeah. of strange because my wife was like, why are you doing ministry if you don't believe in God right now? This is this is strange. And I'm like, well, mm. it's still a good message. People need to hear this. <laughs> it may not be real. but um, And so that was, yeah, really, really hard for me. Um, I, I just, what got me out of it was I remember I was going for a run one day and I like to listen to podcasts when I go for a run. Mm. And I was like, I'm going to listen to a, a Christian podcast. And I just randomly came across this podcast by Andy Stanley. And it was, it was perfect God timing. It was like, okay, let's assume God's not real. This is what we're left with. And this podcast was, this is a, you know, mega church pastor. He's just like, listen, smart people believe in this. This is a, a valid option. This is what we're left with if you take God out of the equation. And I just remember listening to this podcast 
And it was just really depressing what, what you are actually left with. Yeah. Like he's like, this is what, if you talk to Stephen Hawking or Richard Dawkins, this is what is actually people believe without a God. And I was just like, yeah, actually, I don't believe any of that. I do believe in justice. I do believe in goodness. I do believe in choice. I believe in all of these beautiful things. Um, and so that started me back on the journey to connect back with God. Um, and then it really, from that day onwards, I was like, yeah. And I remember I, I kind of set, I was like, God, I, I need to see a win. I haven't, we haven't seen anything here. I need to see a win. I don't want to test you, but I want to test you. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, yeah, um, within a couple of, maybe a couple of months after that prayer, we ran our first youth camp. Um, we had like maybe 50 kids come to this camp. And there's maybe like 20 of them that didn't know, had heard anything about God. There was a girl that was living with us at the time, Raxel, who wasn't a Christian. Um, she had come to us as, and said, listen, I can see that there's something in your life. I can see that you have peace and joy. She's like, I want that. What is it? Mm. And so we've been discipling her ever since. And she's such a close friend of ours. And wow. we have like a weekly discipleship meeting. Um, and we're in the process of helping her migrate to Australia. And yeah, it's, and so after that, I just, I saw, a, I saw a win, like a very clear win from the get go. Like this person had clearly connected with us. She was like, I want what you have. We've been discipling her ever since and it's been going great. And so since that time, I've, I've, my doubts have kind of gone away. And so that was, yeah, long story short, that was probably the hardest yeah. six months of my life. Yeah. I remember having a time in my life where I was like, well, God, are you real? And it was really, you felt, I felt so unsettled. And so like I didn't, yeah. my foundation was completely rocked. And, yeah. um, and I can't imagine what it would be like having your foundation rocked and over in another country, speaking another language without yeah. your, your normal support, I guess, around you. Correct. Yeah, that was hard. That was, that was probably the hardest thing is, because like when I had a hard day in Australia, my wife, she knows how to read me really well. She'd just be like, listen, tomorrow you need to go and have a surf mm -hmm. and then catch up and have a coffee afterwards and then come home the you know the father that you need to be the husband that you need to be yeah and I'm like oh you've been silly whatever and but I would I'd go for a surf and I'd come home I'm like I'm back <laughs> Aaron's back <laughs> I would walk for a bit but I'm back you know and so living here it's been quite hard in the sense that well you know you surf like it's mm. something that I become accustomed to it's mm. like the, the highlight of my day mm. and so to be, to live in a country and not have the thing that you love the most it, it can be quite but I've, I've found other things here that yeah. have now kind of replaced that so so what do you yeah. have over there now um I really enjoy we live in like we're surrounded by coffee here so I drink, I'd have a coffee every morning looking at the mountain um I play football so soccer yeah. um it's not the same as surfing but that's as close as I can get <laughs> I love it so you've been over there I mean I know over COVID you you came back for a bit didn't Correct. you yeah was yeah, that so a tough decision uh no well we were coming back for my sister's wedding oh, that's um right. so yeah. that was the start of 2020 and so we came back for my sister's wedding and then we're only meant to be a couple of months and then COVID hit and we had return flights booked with Virgin. They went under internationally. So we lost our flights. Mm. So we ended up staying in Australia for a year and we kind of, we could have left earlier. We were just getting caught up in that whole COVID thing. Like no one knew what was happening. There was, you know, fear. And like, I remember hearing all of those, you know, oh, the government's not letting people leave. And yeah. we're like, oh, how do we get out? And I remember my wife just called the government one day and said, hey, we live in Colombia. Are we allowed to leave? They're like, yeah, of course you are. Like, no one's stopping you. <laughs> and we're just like, oh. So we booked flights. And so we were in Australia for 2020. And then 2021, we went to Mexico because mm -hmm. my wife wanted to kind of improve her Spanish. Um, so she did a language school there um, for a year um, in a beach called Puerto Escondido. If you're a surfer, most people will know that beach. If you're a surfer. Um, and so she did that. And then I kind of worked with Christian surfers just kind of I surfed every day and then just built relationships with surfers and then did the alpha course with them or started a Bible study with them on the beach. And then after a year, we had another decision actually um, mm. because we were really uncertain because life was going really well in Mexico and mm. living on a beach, having surf. And like I was happy, like it was just amazing. So we're like, hey, we could stay here. Like there's because mm. there's a team with pioneers um, in, in Mexico there in Porto. And so we were like, yeah, let's, we could stay. This is an option. And so when Ange finished her um, language studies, she went away and stayed like in like, like a nice little hotel on the beach, uh, but, but it was further north from where I was. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea was she was going to go away separately and pray. 
I was going to stay at home with the kids and spend the week praying and get some clarity on what, you know, like, where are we going? We felt really confused. And so day one, I started my prayer um, and I was just like, God, I need, I just need a little sign. Just give me something. And then I'm not even joking. As soon as I said that within two minutes of praying that prayer, my phone beat. And there's a, there's a youth that I've been um, discipling in Colombia called Yoel. And he's been a huge part of our, our ministry. And, um, he just randomly sent me a message out of the blue. He had no idea was on my, I was on my week of prayer. And he's just like, hey, man, if you could really pray for the youth because I left him in charge of all of our ministries in Colombia. And he's just like, man, if you could really pray for our youth, like it's it's hard, like I'm finding it's just, you know, like I need support and all this sort of stuff. And so I received that message and I was like, boom, prayer wow. answered. Done. I'm, I can spend the rest of the week. Yeah, I've got an answer. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I spent the rest of the week praying. I'm sure making sure that God never spoke <laughs> to me the rest of the week. He's, he just, just gave me the answer then and there. Wow. Uh, and then Ange went away and she came back at the week and we, um, I said, well, did you get any clarity? Like, where are you leaning? And she asked me the same question. I was like, well, I've, I've got an answer. Like, I've 100% got an answer. And she was like, yeah, I, I really felt that God was like, hey, listen, I've originally called you to Columbia believe in that original call Mm. um, and we have good things for you. And so um, just to backtrack a little bit on why this, that prayer was really important to Mm. me was I was, we were living on a little, uh, this little beach about 30 minutes North of of Porto and it's called Roca Blanca. So right, white rock is what it's called because it's a big Mm -hmm. white rock. And it's like a, it's a right hand point break that just kind of barrels along but it's, it's a far enough away that nobody surfs there. Mm. So I can surf there by myself all day. And it's like amazing. One of the best waves I've ever surfed. Anyway, I went out one day and the swell was massive. It was probably like 15 foot at Porto, which means it was probably about eight foot where we were because the point break loses a bit big. of swell, mm. but it was big. But because it's a point break, it wasn't like gnarly. Um, but I was, I left um, the house and my, my kids were like, oh, can, we want to come surfing because my three kids surf. And I was like, listen, it's crazy today. Like there's a massive sweep and it's just too big. You can't surf. Um, So anyway, I'm surfing and I normally don't hear things from God. Mm -hmm. And I've normally questioned when, when people say, oh, I I hear things from God. I'm kind of like, ah, whatever. I I used to not believe in it. I was kind of like, well, it's not, not believing it, but I was hesitant. I'm just like, oh, okay. Maybe you think something you're not. And so I was, I was surfing. I remember I caught this wave and I'd always catch this, catch the wave and paddle back out mm-hmm. and for some reason I caught this wave and I caught it like really close to the shore and so it was going to be a big paddle back but I always do it yeah. but I felt this thing like this voice inside my heart clear as day it was like Aaron I want you to paddle in walk across the rocks and walk back and then jump in back into the lineup up there if that makes sense so yeah. rather than paddling back walk yep. to the beach and walk up and yep. then paddle out yep. and at first I was like that's weird and um my wife's always really big on listen to that you've got to listen to that I'm always like no that's silly it's just you know (laughs) and so I remember I was kind of like getting I'm like what do I do and then I heard it again like literally it wasn't a voice like but it was just something inside of me that's like Aaron I want you to walk back and then paddle across and I was like all right I'm gonna do it as silly as that is what Mm. have I got to lose so I paddle in I start walking back as I walk back and I get to the bay where I'm about to jump in my son is there in the beach swimming and oh. it's like, there's white water everywhere. It's gnarly. I was like, Parks, what are you doing? He's like, oh, we're here with another family. And the other family had no idea that the surf was that crazy. Mm. And I was like, well, where are they? And they're like, oh, she's over there. And I'm like, where's even Ella, my daughters? And he's like, he mm. points out to the middle of the ocean. <gasps> my two girls had been swept down oh, the beach. Wow. And they were like, there was white water everywhere. I'm, my heart sunk. So I've got, I, I'm like, Parks, go to the shore now. Get out of the water. So mm. I go. Um, one of my daughters made it to the shore safely. My other daughter was just getting like pounded by these oh. waves on top of her. I was paddling there. I'm like, God, please let me get there in time. Yeah. Anyway, I got there. I got near her and a wave came and there was so much white water that <gasps> I lost her for about 30 seconds. And I'm just like, where is she? Where is she? I had, And I was still too far away to like know where she was. Mm. And then eventually I see her hand come up and I paddle up. I grab her. Oh, I get her on the board. And before, like, before, she's obviously in tears. I then, the next wave comes, I ride the white water in on my board. Um, and as she gets to the shore, she's like, daddy, I was drowning. She's like, I prayed that God would send me an angel. 
And I'm like, you have no idea. God answered your prayer. I'm like, because if I hadn't wow. listened to that boy, yeah. if I had paddled back out, I wouldn't have seen my son. I would have yeah. just kept surfing. And I have no doubt that my daughter probably would have drowned. Yeah. Um, and then, so then the, the other family, they were Canadian. They, so him and his daughter got swept out as well. So oh they were struggling goodness. to get in as well. Yeah, like it, it was, it was, it was a gnarly day. Mm. Um, and they ended up making it back in. And and um, yeah, I kind of he came over. He's like, I'm so so sorry. And I'm like, like I was a bit angry. I'm like, what are, what are you doing swimming with my kids like this? But like, well, when we came, it was calm. And yeah. So yeah. long story short, it was. So that was kind of like that's that surfing incident with my daughter was probably like I don't know maybe like two or three weeks before making that decision to return back to Colombia. So when I got that message from Yoel, I was like, no, God speaks to people. I'm going to listen to this. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. where we're at. I'm, I'm in this. Um, and so, so yeah, now I kind of listen to those, you, you know, do. voices that, <laughs> that try to lead me somewhere. That's amazing. And so, um, so then obviously you leave Mexico, go back to Colombia. When did you arrive yeah. there? So we got back there. We spent the whole year in Mexico. Um, we ended up getting back to Colombia in January. Okay. Um, just this year gone. So we've been living here since January. We just, we took a team of Colombians over to Canada to do youth camps. So we were there for three months um, with that kid, Yoel, that we've been mm -hmm. uh, mentoring. So he's stayed on there. Um, he's now working at the camp full time, oh, wow. which is awesome. Yeah. Um, and so we've only just come back to Colombia in the last couple of weeks yeah. from Canada doing youth camps. Incredible. And so does it feel different coming back to Colombia now after, you know, having you, you're in, you had um, 2020 in Australia and then Mexico in 2021, does it feel different to the first time you were there? Um, yeah, it does a little, like, I guess, um, because we're living in a different place now, um, but it's pretty, pretty the same. Like we kind of left off, picked up where we left off. Yeah, We've got the same friend. Um, it did feel, I remember it felt really weird leaving Mexico to come to Colombia because we live in a city here in Colombia. Mm. Um, whereas in Mexico, we were living in a town of like a hundred people. So mm. that was a big difference, obviously coming from knowing everybody in a community, surfing, living on a beach, you know, like we had a, we dust all through our house, like then living in an actual city in an apartment. So that was, I remember like the first day sitting there listening to the traffic and like, you know, people protesting and you can hear gunshots in the background every now and then just sitting there going, what have we done? <laughs> we should be back at a Mexican beach. Um, so that was, that was a bit of a shock, you know, but um, yeah, it's, we've kind of picked up where we've left off. And I, like, I really do believe that we are where we're meant yeah. to be. And I see the difference that we're making in, in people's lives. And so the, like the main thing that I do is here is, um, we obviously run camps like three or four times a year to kind of get the kids in, like the, the kind of like when I say kids, they're, you know, like 16 to 20, mm -hmm. that age group. Um, then what I do is I connect with them afterwards and try to do life with them. Yeah, um, wow. So I work in a lot of, we work in a favela here. Um, I know that's a Brazilian word, but that's the best way to describe it. It's like a, an area of just really houses built on top of each other on a mountain. It's really poor. So I work with a bunch of youth there. Um, just try, helping them find their identity in Christ and helping them yeah, find wow. a lot of them have broken broken homes broken relationships and not the best home environment and I kind of grew up in something like that and mm -hmm. so I can I find that my testimony can really speak into these kids yeah. lives of how to really find peace in life and joy um, and so that's my main my main goal here so I, I look at I look at what we're doing and yeah it's I 100% believe that we're meant yeah. to be here and and you can um, see now, fruit, like yeah. you were saying before, yeah. you couldn't see fruit, whereas it sounds like so Correct. much fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Aaron, yeah. I just, I love what you guys are doing. And also it was really refreshing to hear your story and the way that God's led you um, gently and then obviously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been great. <laughs> it's been really good. Um, is there, so you work with Pioneer, is that right? Pioneer, is that what it's? Yeah. Pioneers. Yep. And do they have a way that people can support pioneers so that they're, they're supporting the, the teams that are on ground? Correct. Or how so does that work? There's two ways that, that pioneers work. So you can give money directly to pioneers and that goes because they've obviously got a big admin staff and stuff like that because mm -hmm. they do a lot of support behind the scenes. 
Um, so people can give directly to that. Mm -hmm. um, you can also give to pioneers to then get that money to go on to certain missionaries, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, they're, they're excellent. They're a really good organization. We've been with them there because we're Aussie. They're super relaxed. And we spoke to a few missionary missionaries that had worked with different organizations and they were like, listen, go with pioneers. They're probably the most relaxed out of, out of all the organizations. And um, I feel that we're pretty relaxed people. So it's, it, it works well for us because they're, yeah, it's really good. Oh, that's excellent. Oh, well, Aaron, so if people wanted to somehow support um, Pioneers, do you go, is it just pioneers.com? Like how do they find? I, just, I would say Google Pioneers yeah. Australia and it'll okay. come up. Um, and that's probably the best way to do it. Um, yeah, to get in contact with them. Uh, as far as looking at what we do, most of our stuff's on Facebook. Like we have closed a closed group on Facebook, but I'm yeah. pretty sure if you were to, wanted to see what we were doing you could google i think it's called partnering with the bullocks mm -hmm. in Colombia. something I, like I that follow you, it. yeah if you could google that you would see what we're doing i've always thought about starting up an instagram page for my thing but i just couldn't be i'm not that tech so i just <laughs> <laughs> seems like a lot of work seems like something that my wife would be good at <laughs> <laughs> I can appreciate that. Well, thank you for your time and just sharing no, so welcome. honestly as well. I, I reckon a lot of people could really connect to what you're saying and sharing. Thanks, Thanks for joining me on Brave with Lisa. I hope that it has inspired or impacted you in a small or large way. Feel free to comment, to subscribe and share with some friends. And please join us next week on another conversation we will have here on this channel on Brave with Lisa.